Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, uh, back with uh, something uh, else really cool. This came to me from Stephen Leary. It's a remake of the A3660. In fact, that's not correct, it's actually a remake of the A3640. So you'll have seen this board when I did a repair of the A3640 for uh, Andy, one of my patrons. Uh, he mentioned it in the Discord channel, could someone have a look? And I said, yeah, actually, I'm interested in looking at that. No worries, fire it over to me. Anyway, I'll post a link to that video up there. You can see this is the uh, limited black edition here. So it was created by Chucky. You can see uh, his name up here somewhere, John Hurtle, I think it says, uh, and his website there. Uh, it's two of them actually, because he's the author of Diag Rom as well. So this was kindly sent to me from my friend Stephen Leary, uh, Terrible Fire, you know, Mr. Terrible Fire. Um, it's really cool. He included this as well. Uh, it's nice to get a, a, a limited edition version of this. I don't know how many of these were made and sold, but it's uh, it's nice, isn't it? Sexy black. Uh, it's got a nice uh, look to it. Uh, and it's all gold-plated. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. So, following up, there were a few options. I could have sourced the uh, components individually, but I went for a kit. Uh, I'm not sure the website's mentioned on here. I don't think it is, actually. So, I'll post a link down below where I got this from. Uh, but you'll see, it's a nice kit, this. What I like about this is 3D printed this tray here <laughs> for all the components. How cool is that? Uh, now everything doesn't fit in. You saw this page here was a couple of uh, pages of uh, paper with various SMD resistors and caps and things taped onto it. We've got uh, a couple, uh, five electrolytics there, just like the ones we fitted on that last uh, A3640. Uh, some instructions uh, as well. But yeah, everything is in here. You can see there were two ROMs. I've got those in my motherboard at the moment. So you'll see that when I tested that A3640 uh, actually, because I had Kickstart 3.9 in there. Uh, so we've got everything here. Crystal, I think that's a voltage regulator. Socket, I think that's the delay line. We've got a jumper, we've got a 68060 socket here. We've got another connector, so I've got one of those going spare. Uh, and all of the gals all pre-programmed. Now, I do have a programmer that would work with these now, but it's just handy that those are already done for me. It saves me a bit of uh, messing around. Uh, and all the PLCC sockets here, I'm not looking forward to fitting those. The nice thing, though, they're not very big, are they? There's not a huge amount of pins, so you know what? I might uh, avoid trying to cut the base and actually just have a go at soldering them uh, pin by pin individually because there's not so many. Uh, it will take me a while, uh, obviously three more there, three more pals, uh, and then a load of 74 series stuff here. So it's going to take me quite a while to assemble this. I'm not going to show you every single thing. I'm going to start with the, the smaller stuff actually, stuff that doesn't stand off the board. If you've seen me do board builds before, uh, like when I did some of the terrible fire ones, I'll post a link or two up there. Um, I'd sometimes just dive in and do the sockets and things first and then finish off with some of the surface mount stuff. But you know what? It makes it a bit easier if you do those connectors and things, you know, the one on the underside here uh, and this uh, and the chips and things last uh, and the crystal, do the crystal and the delay line last. Start by doing all the small piddling little, you know, caps and resistors. There's loads of them down here, look. So that's where I'll start. So I've done the first three there. It didn't take me uh, very long to do that. Uh, we've got one here, one somewhere down here. And uh, all I'm doing is doing the la my, my usual lazy approach. If you use tweezers and do it under magnification, you can uh, do this sort of thing really easy, but at a distance here, so I can't see what I'm doing, but I'm just gonna heat the pad and the uh, resistor, sorry, cap. These are caps, 330 nanofarad. It's tombstone there, so I'm just putting it flat. You can see it's almost in position, so I'm just gonna have the tiniest bit of solder there. Uh, and then it's not straight, the solder doesn't look great. I'm just flying through these, and what I did with these here, what I'll do with all of those ones there in a minute, which is just use hot air, heat it up to 420, and uh, put a bit of flux around each one, and uh, wait for it to reach temperature, and then it pulls itself nicely aligned. So instead of being you know crooked like that, it sort of centralizes itself, bang in the middle of the two pads and the solder flows really nicely on either side just from using a little bit of hot air. So I mean, there's different ways you could do it. You could solder the pads and then use hot air and just bob the, the thing in, you know, the component in as it reaches temperature. I could try that. Uh, but I'm just going to continue like this because it's not going to take me very long to do these, I don't think. Maybe an hour to do all of them, maybe the little ones. And balanced precariously on an Acorn Electron, of all things. 
So yeah, 420 degrees, sorry for moving the camera and stuff here. Just nudge it when it reaches temperature. You see that? That strained up, pulled itself into position. These ones aren't too bad actually. And again, that one, just bob it in and out like that, that's it, in perfect position. Looks nice and clean and the solder has reflowed very nice on those. So I've done the ones around there, I'll show you more in a minute. So it has taken me about an hour and a half to get to this stage. I've done all the caps, uh, well, apart from the electrolytics. So you can see them dotted uh, around the place here. There's quite a, a large fragmentation of them. They are all over the place, which is what you'd expect. You need at least one uh, decoupling cap per chip here. Very few on the underside. I think it's like three or four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, I think just those four. So all I've got left now are the resistors uh, and then the uh, high C's, I guess, and sockets and things. So with all this small stuff, I have literally been skipping through it. Um, I've got all the caps on yesterday, as I explained. Uh, you can see what I'm doing here is just cutting these out, you know, cut two sides and then you can sort of just pull it off here. This is the way these are shipped out. Uh, you can see here there's clues and it tends to be one more than you actually need so it says like one there and you can see there's actually two and he's done that deliberately because trying to cut one and tape it to the thing it'd just be really painful to open and it's hard enough to open as, as it is but the tape actually uh, helps you can see you can open it there and lob that onto the board now the other thing i've been doing here is cross-referencing the parts list here so i can just look down this and i can see there's one 100 there it tells me it's r401 it also tells me it's on the top pcb so r401 is here uh, so yeah it's not easy for me to do this uh, without magnification so uh, anyway i'll just show you in general with resistors i've been doing them slightly different just the capacitors with the capacitors i've been able to just literally make sure i get a tiny little bit of solder on the pad as I solder the pad and the component uh, and then just solder the other side and if it's slightly crooked heat with hot air just tap it and it bobs back into position but with the resistors they're so much smaller you need less solder anyway let me just position that correctly hang on so here we are now it made tombstone what I tend to do is touch the pad and the end of the component leave it for a second just to heat the actual pad up and then touch the smallest amount of solder you can see that's just tombstone slightly what that means is you know it's kind of lifted off the board with the heat heat's kind of sucked it up to the side so all it is just to just touch it and heat it just flatten it like that and try and do the same on the other side now just heat it and add a tiny little bit of solder uh, and then what when i've done a block of them i'll just do this one individually i will just add a tiny little bit of flux to the top like that Heats it with the hot air, and as soon as it reaches a uh, melting point, it kind of sucks itself into position, provided you've not got too much solder on it. Um, and then the other thing is just to push it a little bit, it's not, not there yet. And the only reason I'm doing this is just there you go, it pulled itself into place, it's a presentation. They're all nice and perfectly straight, it looks like it's come from a factory. So it is taking an incredible amount of time, you can see I've got the block of resistors and caps here, whole block up here, I've just put the uh, link there on the regulator. So normally if you're going to use this with an 060, you'd have uh, a 3.3 volt regulator here and the in and the out pin just join them together. So where the 5 volt comes into the regulator it's just going straight across to where the 3.3 volt would go out to here, the VCC pin. Because we're fitting an 040, we need to feed that with 5 volts, not 3.3. All of the SMD resistors and caps and ferrite beads. Interestingly enough, there's a component there marked C400, which is actually looks like a, a diode or transistor, actually. Uh, but everything's uh, all the little small stuff is on the top side. You can see there's a tantalum here. Uh, I had to surface mount that. You can't access the pads. It just literally fits over the profile, so it looks a little bit discoloured because obviously I had to heat it hopefully it's all right and I've got some of the stuff down here so we've just got like three or four rows of things to fit there and these here and then the odd spot component I don't see any of those actually I think that's it 
So I've got your close up there on the, how I'm doing this. Can you see these are all higgledy piggledy? Uh, now I'm trying to do this from a distance, so I cannot see very well what I'm doing here. I'm just doing a tiny, tiny bit of solder to one side. Uh, use the solder to move the other side. You've got to heat it up for too long, otherwise obviously the solder will melt on the other side, I say. Then add some solder on that side again, just a tiny, you know, tiny little bit. The thickness of your solder is key with this, because if you have thick solder like I've got here, it makes it quite hard. From time to time, I'm finding I'm getting quite large blobs and they have to use a bit of braid. Why is that not flowing? Uh, I added flux onto the pads before I lobbed these components on, by the way. Let's just move that over there a bit. Anyway, you get the idea, and then I'll show you in a minute, we'll reflow this with hot air. These large blocks like this though are proving much easier to do. So I will now reflow with hot air. And now you should see them sort of pull themselves into position once they reach temperature. You do tend to have to just give them a nudge as well. You see that one, that first one? It bobbed into position. Second one's not quite. Oh, there it is. Yeah, second one's. Okay. There you go, it's a quick look. So we've got a little bit too much solder on one or two. I'll get that off with some braid. So you could leave all of the cleaning to the end, but I've tried to, uh, you know, keep this clean as I'm going along just makes it easier to you know clean it to handle you don't get flux all over your hands every time you touch the board so yeah what we'll do is get all of the uh, 74 series on one block and then clean up again and then just fit the uh, final sockets and things you know all the PLCC sockets and stuff anyway let's uh, have a go at this with the toothbrush so just have a, a little bit of a scrub around these Yeah, you can see, they're looking pretty good. They're looking pretty good. So next one to the slightly easier stuff, the 7.4 series. So I'm gonna start down here, I think, and then just work my way that way. I might do that one after that one. So uh, I might even do that one first, I don't know. And then I'll get these sockets on here. Sorry, uh, I'm bleeding there. Yeah, then we'll get these uh, sockets on here uh, and finish off with the dip chip here crystal connector and socket and jumpers uh, and the final stand caps all the things that stand off the board significantly and my access is really restricted here i've got the magnification right in the way and the camera to my left uh, what i want to try and do is heat the pad and the solder at the same time mm -hmm. There we go. I need to straighten that chip now because I've moved it just because I'm doing this at a weird angle. So I've shown all the same techniques here umpteen times on my channel before. Uh, you can see I just anchored it in two corners here and then just uh, hold, press the chip down. I'll get some flux on there. I'm using this uh, circuit work stuff here. This came from Dermot Sweeney uh, and it's been pretty good stuff actually. It's been uh, almost as good if not equal to the chip quick stuff that I usually use. I think what I'll do here is swap over to my other soldering iron just because it's got a better tip and I don't want to change the one that's on there. Okay. I'm going to say a better tip, an awful tip, <laughs> but the actual tip, as you can see, is okay. Uh, we'll just get a little bit of uh, solder on there. I might end up with too much solder on this, let's just see. I'll move that one out of the way. Uh, I anchored on this side, so I'm going to start from this side here and we'll just uh, drag down this way. Yeah, that's not too bad actually. First pass pretty much nailed it. Let's just add a bit more solder. And I'm going to sort of start in the middle away from the pin I've soldered. 
uh, and then I will start from the one I soldered. Again, you can see that's uh, pretty good. So it's just a case of uh, repeating that now for all these other 74 series ones. Get a bit more solder. I'd usually do two passes on these one on the actual bottom of the pad near the pin, one on the top, and in fact, do three passes and then just bob in and bob out. You can see lots of the fires around here get coated with solder. That might not be a bad thing actually around the capacitors where the electrolytics go. You can see I'm just reflowing those there. Where the electrolytics go, I'm going to deliberately tin those little wires anyway. A bit of a strange camera angle. It's the only way I can accommodate the camera. So just touching the pad, not the pin, blow a bit of solder. And on the side, uh, pad, not the pin, crazy solder. And then just uh, press it down and reflow. Just make sure it's flat. It only took about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes to do all of these uh, 7 4 series. We're nearly there. Quite a lot of so uh, flux there. Did I say solder? Flux. Uh, anyway, let's just get some solder on the tip. I'll do this uh, top side first. I'm kind of like sitting on top of the pins to start with here. Because the, the pad placing, you know, the pad spacing. Uh, means there's not a lot of uh, room on the end. These ones aren't too bad. There are a few chips in particular that I'll show you in a minute that are very problematic. One of them is barely anything to touch in terms of the pad. So uh, yeah, you need lots of solder to make sure you get right underneath the uh, legs. Finish off on this one here. Giving it time to transfer through, there we go. Just drag that side, a bit more there. Yeah, that's it. Just got one more 7 Series to go on, and then we're on to these PLCC sockets. Well, that's all the 7 4 Series on. Uh, I've been cleaning up as I go along these three chips I'm cleaning at the moment, obviously, the ones that are just stuck on. But what I want to do next is get some IPA and a toothbrush and clean around these properly. Because all I've done is just mop up the initial flux here with uh, cotton buds as I've done each one. You still get little bits of flux there and obviously it's still between the pins and all that sort of stuff. It just makes it easier to uh, handle. I'm sure if you've worked on anything like this yourself before, you'll appreciate the benefit of uh, cleaning up as you go along because otherwise you just get flux absolutely everywhere. But you can see it's uh, really coming on leaps and bounds. The position of that one there is perhaps not as straight as it could be. It's square, but it seems to be sat a little bit lower down than the pads here. Uh, yeah, in general though, it's looking great. Most of the components are actually on there now. It is just the crystal, the delay line, and the PLCC stuff, and obviously the connector here, and the connector there, and the jumper. Regulator's not going on, I've bridged that, I don't know if I showed that, bridged the in and the out where the regulator goes so that 5 volts will come onto this. And then the final thing, I'll stick the electrolytics on here, there are uh, 5 of those just like that are on the A3640. With these, as I say, what I'll do is all these little wires around here, I'm going to turn over these before I do it. So that if the cap ever leaks, it won't or it shouldn't uh, affect the uh, you know wires, that's the plan. I've been looking forward to this bit actually, just uh, cleaning all this flux off here. So I've fitted the socket for the crystal there, now initially you may think it goes there, but it doesn't. It's got all the pins cut off, can you see? A pin, missed two pins, then a pin, missed two pins, then a pin. So that is intended for the crystal. But while we're here, I'm going to use one of my own sockets for the delay line. It makes sense, it's socketable, so why not socket it? It's not going to cause any problems in the case, it's going to be the same height as the crystal here, so I see no reason to not socket that. So in terms of getting these sockets on, I was going to use solder paste, I've tried that, uh, I just I put a little bit on here and uh, melted it, now you can see 
it goes all messy and horrible. And you know what? One of the big problems with this I found, and it might just be the paste that I'm using here, even when you add some flux, the hot air blows the stuff around. So you've got to have it like really low airflow, and then it takes forever to heat up. Uh, well, seemingly. Um, and I don't know, it's just, it's just really messy stuff. So, I mean, you know, I could just, you know, touch a little blob onto each one of the things here, or I could just paint over the whole lot, stick lots of flux, and then heat it, and then the solder paste would separate onto the pads there. But when you've got this on there as well, you could get bridges. That's going to be a nightmare to try and resolve without cutting the base out of the thing. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I did open this up to discussion on the my uh, Patreon Discord, and uh, uh, one of the guys there, I forget his name, I'll stick it up there, thought the same thing that I'd thought, another idea was to, I don't know, I could pre-tin, just gently pre-tin the underneath of there, or get some, some flux already on there, ready. Uh, flux on here, tin up each of the pads there, heat with hot air, wait for it to go molten. As it goes molten, try and uh, heat the underside of here as well, you know, sort of alternate, so I'm preheating the underneath of this, and then carefully just drop that on. It's gonna sink the heat, so it's probably stick instantly, and then reheat and uh, just make sure it's on there properly. So I think that's the approach I'm gonna go with, actually. Put most of the heat into here to get this nice and hot so that the solder balls remain uh, fluid uh, and then just preheat this and then introduce it. I tried something similar to that when uh, I came to do the Archimedes uh, RAM, I think it was on A3010, might be in part 2 or part 3, um, and uh, yeah it ended in tears but there were a lot more pins and actually I was trying to do it on the chip not on a socket before I got to the socket. We've uh, got a number of uh, different positions to uh, do this on so we'll start with one of the small ones, I think we'll do this one up here. This is for the reset, it's marked RST. Uh, well, I presume that's what that means. So we'll try the Antex here, it's got a bigger, flatter surface. I'm sorry the angle might be a bit weird because it's the only way I can accommodate the camera. So I'm just going to initially just uh, tin these up like this. We'll add some flux in a sec. I just want to get a little bit of solder onto each of those. Of course, it doesn't mean this is going to get very messy very quickly. Certainly when I come to clean up, it's going to be lots of flux to remove around there. Right, let's just deal with that bridge. Um, there were a couple of bridges, weren't there? See, so that one's nice and clean now. So, I'm using my uh, tin thing here just to stand this off. I might need to just zoom back out a bit because that's going to affect the focus. So I've got the fume extractor going here as well. I'm just going to reduce the airflow a little bit. I mean, I can approximate, you know, I can guess how long, because when I've been doing the SMD caps, I know roughly how long it takes for these pads in this whole area here to become molten. And we're probably at that point now, to be fair. So, yeah, I'm just gonna try and uh, heat this and that. So I'm trying with magnification here. I'm sorry if you can see my hair. Mm -hmm. Now you see it's, it's gone already. It just goes, it solidifies before you've even had a chance to even position the socket. So I think the best I'm gonna get is to sit the socket on top of the pad, see it. Uh, and then try it. So it's positioned on top. Let's just see if we can uh, if we can do it this way. So the so socket's melting, instantly melting. The socket is instantly melting. I don't know if you saw that. I can see the plastic down here starting to melt instantly. So uh, I don't know. The, the bases are going to have to come out of these. This is not designed. This particular socket here is not designed for hot air application because. Uh, I, you couldn't, I don't know whether you could see that, but the centre part here, as soon as the hot air went onto it, I could see it start to go weird, as if it was melting instantly. Well, I was hoping to be able to do these properly, you know, using hot air, but you can see, having cut the base out and uh, soldered it manually there, with a chip in, 
it's in position perfectly. It's not bowed or anything. I think that the, the bowing or bowing situation comes where you've got a larger socket because you've obviously got you know when it's wider, there's more uh, chance that it's going to start to bow or bow around the the sides there, just because of the length. But when it's such a small socket like this, structurally. It holds in place really well. I didn't put the pieces of the base back in. I just literally just put it in, and it, it's held perfectly in position there. It's the right height. It hasn't sunk down too low, and uh, I think you'll agree that looks okay. So, yeah, it's uh, frustrating me because you really should fit these with hot air. You can just about see here, and you'll see it clearer on macro. The side of this socket here changed colour a little bit, just from literally half a second of hot air. It started to melt within half a second of bringing the hot air into position there. So what you've got to do here is bend your solder so that you can introduce it onto the actual pin. And I've just done this on the two pins here. I know we're a long way away, I'll macro you in one sec. Put it onto the actual pin, then you need a solder in with a super fine point. So I might just try and show you this one if I can. You can just about see what I'm doing from here. Be careful not to touch the edge of the socket and touch the solder at the point where it joins the pin. And that has flowed. The key is making sure you get, I don't know, a cotton bud with some flux on, that's what I did, and rub around the pads before you start so that the pads have all got a coating of flux. Let me just uh, put you on macro. So you can see there's a pin anchored on either side, opposite each other there, and uh, the one above on the left hand side is the one I've just done. So I need to do the remaining ones now. Now what I would say is if you've got a tip smaller than the one I'm using here, so I'll just bring this into shot, you can see that's still pretty large. If you had a smaller one, you could get straight in, this is on at the moment by the way, straight in, you know, in between the little uh, gaps of the plastic here, but it's so small, you do need a super, super, super fine tip. I need one that's like four times finer than the one I've got probably, so avoid melting the base. Yeah, I'm pretty confident if I had a finer tip, I could do it without cutting the bases out. The other thing I've did finally is just use my other solder iron there, just with flow over them. Just, uh, you know, drag, drag around and they come out really clean. There's the odd uh, point down here where you can see there's like a wire and it kind of streaks to the wire. You've got to be very careful you don't inadvertently join something up incorrectly to one of those wires. Now this one came out a lot cleaner than that one did uh, after the flux because I used that cotton bud just to drag a little bit of flux onto the pads rather than just have it everywhere and it was, you know, it's not leaked out anywhere. This one also we used the hot air initially which is why that took me ages to clean up. Anyway, I'll get the base back into here now. Yeah, and with a bit of manipulation, you can see I've got the base back in there, uh, and it's pretty stiff actually, so yeah, you could get the bases back in. Let's get the chip in there. Uh, I have to keep referring to a photo of this PCB, because once you've got the socket on, you can't read the IC number position. So I've got U204 here. Incidentally, while I'm doing all this uh, handling of the board here with the chips on it, certainly with these gals on it, because they'll be a pain. I can reprogram these and dump these now, I think. I've got a programmer that should work with them. Just need to oh, get that aligned the right way. The notch is up here. The notch and the socket is the same way. Top left. Just get it in position there like that. And then just push it in. There we go. So again, it's not uh, bowing, is it? It looks okay. Anyway, if this works, when we reassemble it, I'll be amazed, to be honest. Anyway, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Oh, I've got eight more to go yet. So as you can see, you've got the first five on. I've just got five more to go. Uh, I've got this down to a T now. The easy way to get the base out of these sockets is to literally just press down on it. Do the corners. It snap. And then it should just push out. And it's got all the struts on. When you push it back in, you'll be lucky if you don't lose one of them, but yeah, they've generally all gone in okay. And then I've got some uh, flux on a cotton bud, wipe around the pads here. Use the other end to wipe around the centre just to make sure you get under it around the outside there, just to get as much of the flux off as you can, it's just on the pads. Position our socket, using magnification. I could probably do one like this actually, I can just about see enough here to anchor one point. If the socket moves, just realign it. So that's one 
flow there. So I'll inspect under magnification to make sure it's straight. If it's not, just heat that point and just move the socket until it's perfectly straight. Do the other side. Then do the same thing I do on the chips. Press down, reflow, press down, reflow on the other point, and then solder the remaining points. They're pretty easy, but it's time consuming. Now if you get a bridge, you can see I've got a bridge down here. Just add a bit of uh, solder braid, add some flux onto the solder braid. Try and get it right onto the point where you want to heat those pins there. And as you can see it's gone. Just uh, reflow the odd point there, I've got, I've got a bridge there. I've just added a bit more flux to the braid there and uh, let's try that again. Yeah, there we go. So you can see, I managed to remove those bridges. Let's try that again, just reflow those points. I managed to add more solder. When you've used braid, you will remove the solder. I reflow these afterwards anyway. After I've soldered them with a fine tip, I then just touch them with the Antex tip here, and I find that you can just bob into them, and they reflow perfectly, and don't leave any streaky bits or blobs and things like that. There we go, that's what that one fitted. Yeah, anyway, you can see that's not too bad. Now, on the previous video, I did some drag soldering on one of these 740 or something, and I think someone said, uh, I've been watching Northridge Fixers videos, and uh, you're not doing it right, you need to use hot air, it's quicker. And I'm like, well, yeah, you don't get a cleaner job. Uh, it's easier to drag solder, uh, surface mount, stuff like that. But these sockets, uh, yeah, if uh, you're thinking you could solder these with hot air using the same kit I invite you to buy the same kit I'll post a link down below it's not not cheap actually the full kit's about 250 euros or something it's, it's a lot of money it might even be a bit more with the PCB um, but trying to use hot air on these sockets I don't even think it's viable I think these sockets are not suitable for hot air unless you use a real low temperature and the solder paste use is low melting point maybe Could be wrong. In any case, upload your video to prove otherwise. I would have preferred to have got these on with hot air, but from the te few tests I did, I don't think it's feasible on these sockets. One of the problems these days may be getting sockets that are suitable. That's it. So, that's that bit done. Sorry you can't see much, I thought I'd just try and show you something. Uh, and then I'm using the Antex here just to, to go over the solder point of just drag over it. I get a nice, smooth surface with no sticky out of bits and stuff. Can we flow the odd fire as well whilst I'm there. Rotate the board around periodically and uh, yeah, I'm quite a long way away here actually I can't see as well see that was a bit there where one of them was joining straight to a via although it looks like it's supposed to go to the via let's try that angle from that angle you might be able to see what I'm doing but the iron is probably gonna block it now apologies if it does A big bridge there look the mistake I made here or there I should say oh there we go it's come off is every now and again dab the soldering iron into uh, your you know to the sponge or your copper braid thing whatever it is there you go uh, final side I think because as you reflow you'll pick up additional bits of solder on the tip you know, they accumulate and then you get to a situation where you add lots of solder onto a point. Yeah, that's not too bad now. So just finishing off the final one here now. A 
are so very near completion here and I'll give you a macro on the inside of that in a minute just to show you what these typically look like when I finish with them I do two things here, I clean up initially with the cotton butter then uh, IPA on the toothbrush just to get right up and down the pins and kind of like under the socket and all that sort of stuff you would be better off waiting till the end before you start fitting the chips but yeah I just like to just uh, do it for psychological reasons so you feel like it's more resembled it is it feeling weighty board now it feels near complete there you go not too bad and get the base in and we're on to the home stretch so two things we need to get on here and then we can test I'll do the caps after I've tested it actually the, the electrolytics everything else is on here apart from the jumpers the cal connector CPU socket and those caps so this should have a pin 1 marking I think that's what that indicates there I don't see any other markings on it and pin 1 on the cal connector is here so it's obviously very important you get this the right way around so it wants to go this way I think and now I don't envisage this being easy. Oh, it's going straight on. Yeah, I was, oh, I was kind of expecting the pins to be uh, bent and stuff there, but no, that's seemingly <laughs> gone straight on. That's incredible. Now, the best thing to do here is probably get a load of flux, get a wide chisel tip on your iron and just do some drag soldering, but uh, I can't bother changing my tip, so I'm just going to go over this point at a time. It will take a good 15 minutes at least. I'll anchor a couple of uh, points first, I think. I'll do a couple on each side here. I'll just hold and press it. You want this to be nice and flat. And we'll do the same up here. And again, just uh, hold and gently press. Make sure it's nice and flat. You could argue these uh, ground points here are the things you should focus on. They don't come through very far, those ground points. Are uh, the anchor points there? Yeah, anyway, well, we'll do them anyway. Need quite a lot of solder for those. Yeah, it's weird how they don't stick through. I would have expected those to be further through than that. It is definitely on there, though. You can see that. So the temptation might be just to uh, cut corners and not fit those uh, PLCC sockets that we fitted. I would recommend against that. I would say don't solder the chips on straight to the board because there's like 10 or more of those PLCC chips. If there's a problem with one of them, you're going to regret it. Uh, it also means it's easy to swap them out for either upgraded versions of those chips because there are some mods you can do, you can get like a PIO mode mod, I think, and there's a weight state mod that uh, Andy asked me about recently. But also, if a fault develops in future, it's uh, going to be far easier if they're socketed. Because I've been doing this in batches, I've done some in the middle of the board, some at the back end of the board here on this connector, just to spread the heat. Because as you heat one area and it heat gets hotter and hotter, you can start to warp it actually. Not really the board, but actually the you know the heat on the connector can mean the connector starts to warp. So it's probably a good idea to move up and down, solder in different places and then just complete the remaining ones. We are so close, so it took uh, about 15 minutes to do that, actually. I need to clean all the flux off. I've just used hot air here to relocate that cap because it was slightly crooked. Uh, and things like that might seem a bit pedantic, but in one or two places on these boards, um, you'll find that sockets are right up to them. I'll give you an example. See down here? Look at that cap. If you get that cap there slightly misaligned, you're going to have problems with that socket. Uh, anyway, so our uh, sockets, you can uh, line this up pretty easy, there's three pins down there, you can see the three that uh, stick out down here, 
so it really is that simple uh, again anchor it on a couple of uh, diagonals perhaps so place your bets now do you think it's going to work first time or do you think there's going to be some problem that's going to take me a week to resolve or something I hope to goodness this works I've spent hours and hours on this this made the uh, this makes that uh, CF330 build and the 536 uh, seem like uh, child's play if I'm honest the, the PLCC stuff on this and the number of SMD components while we're on the subject actually that's one nice thing on the uh, 536 that Stephen arranged for which is the bird seed version so you buy the board and it's got all of this bird seed all these caps and resistors already on it yeah that's pretty flat now I'm going to anchor all four corners here actually the suspense is killing me is it going to work I've got some jumpers to fit but as far as I can see they're not really required so I can do that afterwards Uh, finally we're done so it did take me another 20 minutes to do that or 15 minutes maybe so uh, shall I test it without the CPU first mm, yeah I might do that uh, just feel the tops of the chips when it's on just to make sure nothing's getting super hot etc then introduce the processor and retry it and then uh, if that works uh, I don't think it will I, I've got my fingers crossed but you know what there's that many issues here and when I say issues I mean like there could be a damaged uh, connection on the PCB, it was uh, an early version of this, a V1. Is there uh, any fixes or anything I need to apply to this because it's a V1? I don't think so. Um, you know, heating these SMD components and things, could we damage something? Yeah. Temperature, and again, ESD perhaps at various points. So, yeah, uh, will it work? So, just with the board and no processors, let's switch it on. Right, so I've got a black screen switched it off again and I'm just going to just uh, have a little feel around the tops of things here just to make sure nothing's uh, going nuclear and uh, it would seem everything is okay there. I've just grounded myself before I did this by the way so switch it off so this is the processor that kindly came from Andy. He donated this uh, as payment, I guess, uh, which really helped me out for looking at his A3640. Let's just pull that off. Let's do it off the board. Yeah, pin one is up here, so you can see that's correct. It is pretty straight, or they are pretty straight, the pins on that processor. So yeah, that's gone in. I don't see any issues. Let's. Uh, Plug it back in. The jumpers on the motherboard are set to external, external, in relationship to the clocks, because you have two jumpers on there. You have one for a 90 degree phase shifted clock, I think, and one for the CPU clock. And they both need to be set to external, external. The actual board itself here provides the clocks for the board and the CPU. Now, as I power this on, I'm going to have my fingers on top of the uh, CPU just to make sure it doesn't burn up. Yeah, that's not booming. That is not booming. This is what I was afraid of, if I'm honest. A oh, whole lot of effort, and it's not booting. So I've got the Mini Pro connected to the USB port there, and pin one just goes up towards the lever here on the ZIF socket. I've closed that. So sorry about the refresh rate there. If I go into the correct folder here, partial JX, here we go. Uh, U400, that's the one we're just looking at here. Um, I've got two files there, I'm not sure which one's which. Let's just do open. So there's the fuse map for that JEDEC. Yeah, the JEDEC. You think of it as a run file. Uh, it's not, but I think of it as a run file. It just, uh, you know, specifies the fuse map. And the fuse map is, you know, ones and zeros here, you can see that uh, specify the internal uh, structure of the logic within that uh, you know, PAL or GAL or CPLD or whatever. Uh, we've got the device type here set to GAL 22V10B. It's a lattice device, I think. And if we do device verify, 
Verify. There you go. Hang on, Verify stopped. So we've got a difference there. Now I think that's probably because the code I've just loaded, you know, the fuse map, is perhaps uh, the wrong one. Let's try that bottom one, U400 mapper. And um, we'll do device, verify, try again. Verify succeeded. So yeah, you know, there's the different versions of the code here. That's one of the things I did notice, that on the two or three of the uh, gals there, there are two files. You might like a like a Rev1 and a Rev3. So uh, yeah, I've got the later ones, but uh, you know, that's the sort of thing you could do if you had a, an A3640. Uh, yourself and you want to you know check what versions you got you could compare to the various versions of the JEDX here uh, and of course then you could reprogram them I'm not sure whether I think you could probably set these so they can't be reprogrammed there might be a few uh, you know bits or something in the configuration here that specifies that it's not reprogrammable so this is the following day I spent I kid you not about three hours last night trying to diagnose what was going on with this just black screen not booting at all, no activity on the IDE. Uh, I spent ages, well, three hours. I took every chip off, inspected all the solder points underneath, put them all back on, took them all back off, cleaned up all the edges of the chips with the fiberglass pen gently, cleaned all the sockets with IPA, put them all back on. Still didn't work. Uh, got my new programmer, I'll perhaps show you that in a minute. And I managed to uh, read the larger chips because I have a dip to. Uh, uh, PLCC adapter of the right pin count. These smaller ones are 20 pin. I don't have a dip to uh, PLCC for that. But anyway, I ordered one of those. Uh, and in the meantime, I then compared, as I'll show you in a minute, photos or close ups of the, the PCB. And I was looking at the points where you get the little wires next to the points where you solder here because it's very easy to trail a bit of solder across. And I thought, I wonder if it's one of those. So I checked the four or five suspects there. Couldn't find an issue. Still wasn't working. And I thought, this is just bizarre you know I, I looked at everything everything on the underside everything on the top side and uh, i could not find an issue i even contacted chucky and asked the question is there anything specific i need to do on this rev one pcb here like uh, for example a fixed wire because it's, it is an early version i think it's, it's, this has been superseded by uh, 1.1 i think uh, you didn't get a chance to come back before that i fitted a cap there to see if it was because i've not got the electrolytics on did it need a little bit of stability didn't make a difference and uh, finally i thought let's remove all these blooming bases so i removed all the bases and i think i forget where it was i think it might have been on the bus con over here we had uh, one of these bases you can see well it did have all four of the struts and because it had been pushed in from the top when it was taken out from the bottom one of these struts just happened to have touched one of the pins on one side and was keeping the pin pressed in so that it wasn't making a connection with the chip and that's what it was and I spent hours hours on it roughly three hours anyway so you can see today I have labelled up all the chips yeah the labels are a bit crooked I've had to abbreviate them we've got two terminations we've got a term here and a term there that's like term OE or something like that I think I forget um, but the main thing is it's got the chip numbers U211, 213, 203, 400 etc because um, you can't see them this is one problem with this when you've got sockets on you can't see the IC designation you've got a clue in terms of the, uh, the cap positions that are nearby but yeah it's uh, it makes it quite hard to work out what chip is what so the other thing I've just done is I've cut off the little struts from the base, can you see that? And used a little bit of elastic -y glue here, just a tiny drip underneath that base, just to hold it in place so that it doesn't just fall around and shift around inside there. So let's get the reset one back in now and I'll continue my way around the other positions. Oh, I can't get that back in now. Structurally, these sockets are really good. You know, it grips really well there. Uh, I'll just show you. So in terms of getting these out, my PLCC tool can't get low enough to get under the chip. So I have no choice but to use a screwdriver. So we'll do this bank of four here. We we'll just lift on one side a little bit, rotate it, and do the same on the opposite side. Try and get there. You go under the diagonal edge and back on that side again. Obviously, you wouldn't want to do this uh, too many times, but because the slightly slacker than they would be if they had that struts, you know, the struts joining them up. It makes it quite easy to get them in and out, but at the same time they hold fairly well. So this is one of the larger ones. I'm just literally cutting these little struts off. 
because they just serve no purpose once they've been cut off unless you were to join them back up to the socket they are pointless and just can have the possibility of interfering with the uh, pins if you like one side of this is flat the other one's got four little dots that help it stand off and you can see I'm just getting a little bit of that elastic -y glue there it's just like you who it's like a rubber you know it sets and it's like a stretchy rubber but it will just hold that in place and if we just uh, drop that into the center there and then I'll just uh, use my probe to align it really I should get that the pin one marking the right way around let's try and do that there we go and then just press it down like that that's it and we can get the chip back in that's it so whilst this is working I'm working my way around these just to check and here's another one this is one, this side here, I don't know how well that's going to focus, but this one, when I put the base in, the, one of the little plastic struts must have just gone down here and pushed this pin in. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to tell there, but yeah, these are kind of raised up and that one's sunk down just a little bit. So, it's a good job I've came inside this just to, to do this, to put the bases back in. Uh, what I'll need to do under magnification is use my craft knife here and uh, get right on the edge of that pin and just try and lift it up a little bit so that it's in line with the others it's dead easy to move the hard bit is getting uh, well seeing what you're doing right so it's had the pinball illusion test for about 10 minutes dead stable booted first time so i'm confident that all those sockets are okay now i did find in total about three pins that i just had to just gently bend out a little bit not a lot just a little bit maybe i don't know half a millimeter so yeah it was uh, another occam's razor the three hours i spent was me chasing my own tail because uh, those little bases were the issue i am so looking forward to cleaning up because i've got so much uh, stuff all over the place here from the chaotic build you know all the bits of uh, smd stuff left over because the thing is there's lots of additional components uh, I'll show you some. Hang on. My extraction fan needs cleaning there. Can you see all the fluff and dust that's come from the environment that's landed on that? That's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Uh, yeah, look at all the SMD components here. There's quite a lot. Some of these have got several or more spares still. Uh, that one's got two, three. Yeah, so there's like three 1Ks there. Uh, four 2K2s so there are spares of each component so yeah I can need to sort all those out and merge them with my components anyway let's uh, get these on so we'll do the one down here this is in the same place it is on the A3640 you know the official Commodore one and uh, obviously the silk screen's correct on these none of these are wrong and I can always move it if I nudge it and bound to nudge it yeah, I've nudged it. You can just literally solder one side, uh, you know, hold the cap and then move it a little bit until you're happy. It's in place. Funnily enough, I said the exact same thing on the exact same cap on the A3640 video. I'm getting deja vu flashbacks here. Hang on. Yeah, that's alright. Uh, then we could rotate that uh, around and uh, just add a little bit of solder down here. You know, I think I've got exactly the same issue I had when I did the A3641 in that the pad here ain't got as much uh, clearance as the one on the other side. Anyway, you can see that cap's on there, so I'll just do the same for the other three. Now the thing I will show you, and I talked about this, the wires around this cap, so you can see there's one there, there's one there, and a few here. I'm just going to just uh, turn over them. Why not? They're exposed. See, look how easy that was. That's one done. Um, they're exposed so why not and then if the cap does leak it ain't going to get into that wire I'm going to watch that socket there a lot of the time you'll find you just uh, 
end up turning these anyway, not these ones particularly, but the ones near things you solder in. And I think good for good measure, I'm just going to do these ones here. Obviously, if I thought ahead, I would have done some of the ones under these components if they're around there, but uh, anyway, you can see the ones around there now have been turned. Obviously, there's the one here with the where the cap leg goes, but we'll do that when we stick the cap on in a sec. But I'm just going to wipe around there now. I've just uh, soldered those four or five uh, vias there. So you can see I tinned up all of the vias all around that area there, right up to here actually. So I'll get that cap on. Again, it's probably a bit too far down on one side, but it really isn't the end of the world. We've got a nice little solder point there, look. That's fine. Now this one's the final one, but uh, we need to do all these little vias around here. Well, we don't need to, but I forget it's uh, probably a good thing to do. There's loads of little vias here. Can you see this? There's two here, right next to there. I don't know whether they actually go to that pad. They might not do. Yeah, it's not 100% visible, but it kind of looks to me like those do not join to that pad on that side, and they aren't joined at the moment. I'm uh, going to get a bit of flux on here just to get rid of uh, the blobbiness to them, but also so that I can use the uh, braid on that uh, pad on that side, actually. I'll start on the one on the other side that's already got solder on it. So do be careful when assembling these boards because the vias can place like that there very very close. One thing I'll point out with these uh, jumpers, they were incredibly hard to get through the holes. The holes, you can see here, look at the top one. Uh, let me try and show you. They're not drilled quite wide enough. They're almost. They're like. They're pretty much on the verge of. Hang on, where's it gone now? The problem is they uh, will barely go into these holes. I didn't have that problem with the Matrom jumper. So the holes there must have been slightly wider. Can you see? Look, I can't get it on. I to force it, and then look, the plastic bit's gone down, and the pins haven't gone through. So I'm having to just very carefully grip them and try and press them through just a little bit. They are going in but it's very tight. Right let's just solder those and then I can clean all of the uh, solder points around the CPU and the Kel connector. And in case you're wondering what those for, this one is marked 5 volts and ground up here, so you could connect a fan to that. And that one says thermo, thermocouple, so you could uh, put a thermocouple on there. I think the 060 has a thermocouple built in. I'm not sure how accurate it is, how easy it is to read uh, in the Amiga, whether you need to monitor a particular pin on it or something. I honestly don't know. You know, it might need a hardware thing or it might just be software. Uh, but the 040 doesn't have that, I don't think. Yeah, it's looking a lot better. Obviously we've got uh, some IPA up here. So I'm told you can run these literally without a final heat sink, but I, I did notice when it's under extreme use for an hour or so, it gets pretty hot actually. So I've got a uh, 486 fan here, 
I've removed the mounting bracket that's underneath and I'm just going to use some thermal 3M adhesive and uh, mount it on there and it plugs nicely onto the uh, pin header there it's 5 volts, this is a 12 volt fan but it'll be fine it just means when I start to use this in uh, warmer weather and I probably will be using this in spring and summer it's, uh, it's not going to overheat and of course if I ever get a case uh, I keep looking for one, I've got some money saved uh, actually that was paid back from some insurance premiums that on a policy that was refunded uh, I can actually buy a case as long as it's not crazily priced yeah so that should be it stick that back on, make sure you get the ground the right way alright let's give that a try yeah there we go so it's not rotating, it's RPM is nowhere near what it would be with 12 volts I'm not sure 12 volts is on this board, it might be somewhere on the actual connector here, you know the uh, Kel connector but yeah that's alright, we've got a nice amount of airflow coming out the sides there so it's going to keep that nice and cool and you could incidentally run that particular chip at 40 MHz you need to fit an 80 MHz crystal here you then may run into some issues with the delay line, well you will if you go to the next step up, the normal mod that people do is to stick a 66 MHz crystal in here which will run the processor at 33 and the motherboard will be slightly over well will be overclocked as well uh, and this is where this empty pad here comes in it's uh, an extra turn on the delay line I think so you'd probably move from the 5 nanoseconds position where I've got a resistor at the moment to the 10 nanoseconds position and I think at 60, with a 66 MHz crystal this would run at 33 I'm sure it'd be okay the particular processor I've got on there is rated up to 40 MHz so uh, I don't know I might try that I do know that I tried on my A3630 uh, uh, with a 66 MHz crystal and it works fine I can do that but I'm overclocking the motherboard so do you want to overclock your motherboard? I don't. I don't mind overclocking the processor because you can get away with it. The kind of, you know, they were designed with a tolerance in mind. And the way Motorola tended to work with their processors, at the particular point they were manufacturing, they aimed at the higher clock speed. You know, so, so let's say they had a 50 in their range, they would aim to try and get 50, and then anything that wasn't quite, you know, its thermal characteristics or its, uh, you know, it would crash out or something at say 50, they would then stamp at 40, uh, you know, or 33, etc. So you do tend to find that uh, with certain uh, revisions of these CPUs, uh, it's the same with the 030 and the 060, you can get much higher clock speeds out of them. You can see that thermal adhesive kind of, you know, allows a bit of a movement there as well so I've been able to strain that out a little bit so if you saw the 3640 repair video I did you'll have seen these benchmarks already for this processor let's have a look anyway yeah so it's coming up uh, one there it's exactly the same as the uh, stock benchmark for this and uh, A4068040 25 megahertz yeah one is the ratio and if we do it in integer math it's going to be identical to the, the last board I looked at there. Yeah, there we go. There you go, pretty much spot on what you'd expect for an A4000-40 running at 25 megahertz. So I'm using the A2000 to A4000 keyboard adapter that I showed in a previous video. Let's just uh, plug that in. It should do it well it's off really. Along with the A2000 keyboard that I also made in a previous video. Yeah, I worked out what I need there. I didn't have 68040 library in place, so that probably explains well. In the last video, when we looked at the A3640 repair there for Alex, oh, not enough memory. 16 meg fast required. If you have enough, try a reboot. That's weird. We do have 16 meg. <laughs> it still isn't enough. I think it's because of the desktop resolution and the background stuff and however this compact flashcard's set up. So, uh, hmm, not sure how to get around that. But anyway, let's just close that down. What should work now is the FPU test. Because in the previous video, we ran it in here, and we went into co-processor math here on these, and ran the beach ball, it failed. There you go, you can see now that's working. And that's very fast, so I mean, that's using a combination of the FPU and the CPU, because it lacks that transcendental functions or whatever it is. So that explains in the last video why that didn't work. And it also explains why that demo wouldn't start there, but we do need to do something because we've only got like 12.5 meg free there, look. 
try Gloom 3 I guess, let's see what that runs like on here. Hopefully that will work. Yeah, there we go. Right, let's try that, continue. Let's just see what that's like. Yeah, a bit jerky. <laughs> Very jerky. <laughs> this is where your 060 is really needed. There's just something I want to just check, actually. In that video, one of the things I noticed, and you may notice, the walls looked sloped. <laughs> it's like we were in along, and the, the walls look sloped, and I'm sure I have never seen sloped walls on the Amiga version of Doom before. I want to see if it's any different on this one. So, let's see what that looks like. Yeah, the walls aren't sloping. At least they're not to my eyes. Maybe it's because of the angle of the cameras are. If you're looking upwards towards the screen, it may look, uh, look sloped. You can see how well that runs, that's just unbelievable. And of course, <laughs> you know, if you want the best experience, play on the PC. But it's just something cool about being able to play Doom on the Amiga. You can connect a MIDI interface up, I think, and get the music as well. So I'm trying to use a Blizz Kick here. Uh, you might just be able to see that. I'm uh, referring to the full path there. So I've got like uh, system devs kickstarts kick four zero zero six eight dot eight four thousand space CPU card. Uh, and if I press return, it comes up saying uh, Turbo Bob Matt Ron tool written by Harry Puryu uh, Sinaton couldn't kick file a system devs kickstart and obviously it's referring to the ROM so it couldn't kick that for some reason I don't understand why but the whole idea behind this map ROM I think it loads it into RAM somewhere uh, and then I think it's doing some address decoding and resetting the system and now I don't know that it relies on the MMU to do that so if you have any experience of using Blizz Kick, is that does it work with the standard uh, Commodore CPU card from the research I've done, it suggests it does, but I just can't get it working. I'm not sure why. The map ROM jumper is enabled on the card. So that's what this jumper is here, and it's in the N position here. If you move it to the right, it's disabled. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to test TFX. If you're not aware, TFX, Tactical Fighter Experiment, was a game created by DID, Digital Integration Design, is it? I'm not sure. Uh, published by Ocean, I think, or it was going to be. Uh, hang on, yes, over right. And then ultimately, it never came to release. I think it was released on a PC. I could be wrong. Uh, but what actually happened is they released it on a cover disc. Now, there were a number of patches came out after release. I think I managed to find a version of, on a HDF file here. I'm not sure if it was Steve or somebody else created this. Uh, and it seems to run really well. At least it did in the emulator. I'm just testing it for the first time here on the actual 040. The other thing you've got to bear in mind, there are various configurations for this game. You know, builds. There's an 040 build that just doesn't run the stock version from the CD, you know, from the cover disc that I tried. So, let's see what this runs like. That runs pretty well, actually. I'm amazed how much faster that is than it was a minute ago. So again, the detail level, I'm not sure how it's set. We can have a look at that in a sec, just to see if we can up the detail level. When we come to look at the 060, what I liked about this is all the speech and the level of detail, very impressive. It's quite hard with a digital joystick, as you can imagine. You really want an analog joystick when you're playing something like this. That enemy's flying away from me. You can see it though. Oh, we've got a lock on there, look. Oh, almost had a lock on. You've got to get blooming close, haven't you, before you can fire these missiles. I don't know where he's gone. There he is. Come on, give us a lock. Oh my god. Yeah, it's still pretty hard on an 040, because you can see it's... Uh... Oh my goodness. It's a wee bit jerky. Alright, missile away. I think. Yep, 
Yeah, yeah, I'll always hit it. The other thing you need to do when you set up a 68040 or 060 in an A4000 like this, or any other Amiga, you need to copy the relevant libs in there. So you can see I've got the 68040 uh, library file there, and the ones for the 68060 and stuff as well. Uh, without that, that's where the FPU stuff goes uh, crazy, you know, because it's not got that library. So there's not much more else I can show you, it's the same old stuff really, Frontier and everything runs just the same as it did on the A3640. Uh, everything is working really well, I've been using this for a number of hours now, playing lots of games and demos and things on it. It's sweet. Anyway, I'll uh, show you a close of the board just so you can see how it's turned out really. I mean you can see from there roughly, but I'll give you some close ups so you can see some of the soldering and what have you. So the kit here came from uh, the Commodore Amiga shop. The website is amiga68k.com. Uh, Nicholas kindly provided this. I think this came from Switzerland. You can see the currency there, CHF519. It's pretty pricey, but that's a full uh, kit there. You can uh, get various options on his website. Let's just uh, scroll down and have a look at that. You can have it fully built with no CPU, fully built uh, with a, a specific CPU there. Yeah, I'm not sure he's got the kit on his store at the moment. He might be out of stock. But if you are interested in one of these kits, obviously contact him. Uh, and if you check back in a month or so, I wouldn't be surprised if he's got the uh, the kits back in stock. You can get them, I think he had the option with or without the PCB. That was kindly added because I already had a PCB and I was like, well, can I get it slightly cheaper because I've got a PCB and a Kel connector. As things stood, I uh, just went for the option with the Kel connector, so I've got a, a spare one. The 3D printed uh, component tray is really nice, really nice. I'm tempted to send this back to him actually, see if he can recycle it, because it's no use to me now. Uh, anyway, and you also get two fully licensed Kickstart 3.9 ROMs with the kit as well, which is really nice. So a quick scan around the board, there might be the odd little bit of flux that I've missed, I don't think so. So yeah, my labels could be cut a bit straight, you can see like the top of that one's not straight, I had to abbreviate some of these things. That's supposed to say tax lat lat. Uh, that's supposed to be uh, specific, so like term OE or something like that. I think or one of them is. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, you can see everything looks good. The sockets are as straight as I can get them. Really, soldering on all of these smaller components. Uh, I spent ages just making sure they're all nice and straight with equal sizings of solder on the pads and things there uh, it's come out really really well I think the only thing that's caught my eye is this chip sits a bit lower down it's like nearer to these pads than those pads so in the terms of the profile here you can see this one in particular it stands off a little bit this one's centralized this one's just a little bit lower but everything's nice and straight there you've got nice uh, solder points on the Kel connector there and a quick look on the underside there so yeah uh, slightly bigger blobs on there than I would have liked I could spend time resizing those but I think you'd agree that's turned out pretty good really there are loads of hidden messages on this silk screen here some of them are in black <laughs> so it's like you've got to look really closely there's like one or two that when you get really close up here like this you can just about see like some little secret messages and things. It's uh, amazing how many there are. One of them says, "Have you found all the messages <laughs> yet?" Which uh, made me laugh. This one down here, look, you can just about see there. I think there might be one up here. I think it's just, like Amiga never dies or something like that. There's a few like that. So uh, yeah, it's uh, lots of love gone into this. Yeah, that one there says uh, Amiga never dies. I think it says, uh, and obviously lots of messages about keeping stuff open source which is really nice, so thank you very much to Chucky, John Hurtle, for creating the A3640-60 PCB here. Um, he's done an amazing job, uh, and thank you for providing it to Stephen Leary, and thank you to Stephen Leary for providing it to me. And uh, thanks to Andy in the, from the previous video there for providing the 040 for this. It just uh, meant I've got up and running really quick. Had I not got the 040 and bought a new 040, the point when I came to test this and it wasn't working, I'd have been questioning the 040. So it's nice to have a good known working chip when you're working with something like this. So you may have spotted on the close-up there just the odd fibre, so there is the odd bit of hair on there, I'll get those off. But 
yeah it's looking pristine uh, there are some other things worth pointing out this is a v1 i think the later versions there have been some modifications so you can have like a, a little smd delay line instead of these chips that are starting to probably become harder to find um, the chip here you uh sorry this chip here u101 there are two positions for this on the later revision board so you can have two alternate ic's because the chip that's on there now uh the one that was originally on the a3640 again are starting to become hard to find and i think also it's about the characteristics of that ic if you were to overclock this to say 75 you'll probably just about get away with it anything beyond so 77 78 megahertz you start to have a problem with this ic and the new ic that goes in the other footprint of u101 there's two positions for two chips if you use that chip there you can go higher on your clock speed you might get up to 100 without any issues provided your processor can run that fast obviously you'd be using an 060 at 100 not an 040 i'm not sure 040s can go much beyond uh, 50 uh, you might get 40 or 50 out of them maybe a bit more i don't know post your comments down below so i could start to tidy up now and then i'll go away and uh, have a play on this for the rest of the weekend i think uh, so i hope you found the video interesting Thank you very much for watching, subscribing and commenting. Uh, if you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. I'll catch you in the next video.